Um, so our theme today is integrated thinking, reporting and assurance in action. And we're going to have a really special uh, case study uh, of an Australian uh, superannuation fund called CBUS. So if we could move on one slide, please. We bring you the webinar today from the um, Integrated Reporting Business Network. Uh, normally this is uh, a closed webinar for business network participants. Uh, and the case study was such a strong and uh, that we should open it up um, to the network uh, and uh, friends and colleagues uh, of, um, uh, of uh, the speakers, uh, and of uh, uh, the IRRC team. So uh, uh, we're very pleased to have you all. Uh, uh, is our global flagship program um, to develop uh, and reporting um, with leading businesses, provides an opportunity to learn from peers um, and technical experts, share experiences through case studies um, and address uh, implementation challenges. Um, and really to, to network and to gain confidence um, to make the transition towards integrated thinking and integrated reporting. Uh, we include the link below if you'd like to find out more, if anybody is interested uh, in exploring joining the business network, uh, then please contact us. We'd be very pleased to hear from you. So we move on the next slide, please, Katrina. So a brief overview of the agenda, uh, an hour and a half um, for this meeting. Uh, we would like to make it uh, as interactive as possible. Um, so please use the chat function um, to ask if you uh, post the questions to everyone, uh, then everybody will be able to see the questions you've raised. Um, we will pause periodically um, for Q&A, um, and I very much hope that you will use that as an opportunity um, to ask questions of our two amazing um, speakers. Um, so uh, the first, uh, um, um, uh, is a video, it's a pre-recorded video um, uh, on integrated reporting and long-term asset ownership. Uh, we'll then hear the story of CBUS's integrated reporting uh, and thinking journey. If we could go back up the slides. One more. Oh, there we go. Uh, then we'll hear um, the story of KPMG's assurance of CBUS's integrated report, uh, and then we'll have uh, a Q&A. So if we move on one slide, I'll introduce our amazing speakers. So we're very pleased uh, to welcome David Atkin, uh, who is the CEO of CBUS Super, one of Australia's largest super funds, has 759,000 members um, and assets under management of 56 billion uh, Australian dollars as of uh, the end of 2019. Uh, we have Michael Bray, uh, esteemed uh, partner at KPMG, um, very esteemed board member of the IIRC uh, and a fellow of Deakin University uh, in Victoria in Australia. Um, by video, um, and this is a pre-recorded video, so I'm afraid Keith isn't available uh, to answer questions. I think it's 4 a.m. for him at the moment. Uh, we have Keith Ambashir um, for KPA Advisory. In fact, we're going to start with Keith. And if we get that uh, rolling now, because there's a slight gap at the beginning, uh, Keith is going to uh, talk about the value and the importance of integrated reporting in the context of long-term asset ownership, um, particularly uh, from amongst uh, pension funds. So there will be a slight silence. I'm going to switch off my video and we very much look forward to hearing what Keith has to say. I think about organizations and what makes organizations effective. And uh, I can get it down to five things. One is organizational mission clarity. You know, why does the organization exist? What's the value proposition? Can that be clearly articulated? The second, what resources does the organization have at its disposal to actually execute the mission? They include things like financial capital, physical capital, intellectual capital, especially the board of directors, the governance function of the organization. Uh, that is a key asset that needs to be very carefully thought about. And its role is really to connect uh, the mission of the organization to the stakeholders, the owners, and the people on whose behalf the organization is creating value. 
The third one has to do with business model. How does the organization actually go about creating that value that it's supposed to be creating? The fourth question has to do with how should the organization measure performance, whether it's actually executing its mission, and how's it doing? How is the organization actually performing in the marketplace? The final question then becomes, sitting today, looking forward, what's the plan? What's the strategy for going forward from here? If you think of it, an effective organization is comfortable doing those five things, uh, then we can talk about integrated reporting. And how do those five things integrate with each other? And uh, then the reporting part is, what's the narrative? How do you tell the story of the organization to stakeholders, to a broader audience? So where does integrated reporting fit into this five-dimensional organizational effectiveness space? Three things that I think are important. One is an organization needs to think integratively of how those five areas fit together, and the integrated reporting framework facilitates that. The second is, is that it actually creates a framework for the narrative. Uh, this is a great way to tell the story, to go from uh, dimension one through five, and uh, it, it helps enlighten all those who should know about the organization, the stakeholders, the owners, what the organization is actually doing. And the third one is really, I think, uh, an interesting one. By saying these things, you actually have to do these things. And uh, there's a, a Canadian called uh, Marshall McLuhan, who once said very famously, the medium is the message. And I think it's, it's relevant to this discussion because uh, if the medium is integrated reporting, the message is that we've thought about these things, we can communicate these things, and in that process, we actually become more effective than maybe we have been in the past. So uh, if we now focus on uh, pension funds, super funds, organizations that provide retirement income services, uh, what's special about them? Uh, as part of what these organizations do is they invest in other organizations. In other words, they're investors in a whole range of other businesses. Active ownership increasingly means knowing what those other organizations that you're investing in, what they actually do. You want those investee corporations to be using the integrated reporting framework. It's very difficult to get them to do that if you don't do it yourself. So that's the extra dimension, I think, for asset owners. If they expect the organizations they invest in to do this, they need to do it themselves. Otherwise, they have no credibility. The logical question in this discussion then is, uh, what's the state of adoption? Where does it currently stand in the minds of uh, asset owner organizations? It'd be wrong to say that there's wide adoption today of this, this framework in use in the marketplace. Having said that, I wrote a, a piece on this last year using uh, a Peter Drucker uh, metaphor. He writes about wagon trains, and uh, this goes back 150 years. Uh, settling the prairies, heading west. The question then becomes, uh, how do you make them go faster? And his answer was, you go to the lead wagons and you see what they're doing, and you uh, take those lessons and apply them to the rest of the wagon train. Then everybody goes faster. So if you apply that to the adoption of integrated reporting, uh, where are the lead wagons? And uh, so I had the pleasure of uh, of discovering that the CBUS super organization in Australia actually is one of those lead wagons. Uh, so I wrote a piece on how they've used the framework for the last four years and how it's actually improved the organization uh, over that time period. David Atkin, the CEO, was uh, gracious enough to actually come to Toronto last year uh, where we were able to get most of the large really Canadian funds together to have a workshop on integrated reporting and for David to tell the story of how CBIS had been using it the last four years very successfully and effectively. And I think that's had a real impact in Canada and we're now actually starting to see some great organizations in the sense that um, you know they have the mission clarity, they have the governance, they have a lot of the pieces uh, now starting to realize that 
this framework is actually a great way to tell the story of the value they're already creating. It's been very encouraging to see over the last six months the movement in thinking in the Canadian funds with respect to adopting the IR framework more formally than they have in the past. So the lead wagon theory still works, uh, that if you can find lead wagons and others can learn from that, and I think through that process, I'm optimistic that the use of the framework will continue to spread and make uh, pension organizations better organizations in the years ahead. Great. Well, thank you uh, in absentia uh, to Keith. Uh, for those who've, who've just joined, uh, Keith uh, pre-recorded that. Uh, and uh, um, we were able to play it. And that was, uh, I think, has set things up extremely well um, for um, our next speaker. Um, so if we could move on one slide. Um, uh, very pleased, uh, as I said, to welcome uh, David Atkin, the CEO of CBUS, uh, who's going to uh, give an overview of the integrated reporting and integrated thinking journey for CBUS. And we will pause for Q&A um, after David uh, and before we get cracking with Michael. So uh, David, uh, hearty welcomes. Hello everyone, hopefully everyone can uh, see me and uh, hear me. Uh, so, uh, terrific to be involved uh, with everyone today. And um, uh, first I'd like to do a welcome to country, which is traditional in, our, in, in Australia. Um, our projects and work touch many parts of our country where members and elders of the local Aboriginal community have been custodians for many centuries. We'd like to acknowledge their living culture and their unique role in the life of these regions. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're holding our meetings on the traditional lands and acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge all other cultures we have present here today. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, in terms of CBUS, you had a little bit of an intro there. Um, I'd like to take you through our journey at CBUS, including the way that uh, integrated reporting has strengthened our fund but also challenged us. Um, we do feel that the framework has greatly improved the value we create for our members and our stakeholders over the long term. And it's been particularly useful for us as a long term owner of assets and as a fiduciary for our members. And given the, that in the last few months, everyone's world, you know, whether it's employment, economic, financial, social, family and wellbeing has been challenged by the global pandemic. I'd also like to reflect on how integrated reporting has enabled us to respond more effectively as an organisation to COVID-19 and to provide a positive narrative for our members and our stakeholders about the positive role our fund can play in the road to recovering. So in terms of CBUS, um, Australia's, Australian, sorry, Australia's retirement uh, income system was created in the late 80s and it was initially through an industrial campaign run by trade unions uh, and uh, particularly the building construction unions, uh, which is where our fund uh, uh, was, was established. Uh, and then in the early 1990s, the Australian government legislated a universal scheme in which all the employees uh, are required to contribute a portion of their wages, it's now currently 9.5% uh, their, for their retirement. Uh, and so, you know, we have got a universal and a compulsory saving system here in Australia. CBUS was a, um, uh, one of the first funds established in 1984, uh, and it's an all profits to members uh, alternative to the existing funds of the time, which were run by insurance companies and banks. Our governance is that we're run by, uh, our, our shareholders are uh, trade union associations and employer associations, and together, uh, they've been the stewards of this fund, uh, uh, and they come from the building and construction industry. So, uh, in terms of our journey, CBUS has always had a strong relationship with its members. Um, uh, we've had strong loyalty, uh, a strong value proposition. Um, and we've also been, as, a, as an asset owner, long-term, uh, you know, we've been long-term in our perspective. You know, our members could join us at 16 years old as, apprentice, as an apprentice, uh, and, you know, we would like to be there as they uh, come into an employee, often set up their own business, um, and, as, and then as they move into retirement. And so our horizon is over several generations. It's, it's you know, 40, 50, 60 years 
potentially of a person's life in our fund. And so when we think about investment strategy, it's very much with that long-term lens. Now, for a long time, we believe that uh, there are many externalities that are not properly priced in to the way the investment uh, community um, operates, that you know, too much of it has been short-term uh, in its nature. Um, and so you know, from the early 2000s, we've been very much a believer that environmental, social and governance factors, but particularly starting with the governance factors, uh, are important components of the way we need to think about risk and opportunity and that we need to assess those ESG risks when we're thinking about investing. Um, so in that context, uh, you know, um, five or six years ago, we could see that while the ESG agenda was developing, there was still very much a, a disconnect. You kind of had the ESG agenda sitting or the sustainability or responsible investment, whichever the language you want to use, sitting to the side, um, uh, but not being truly integrated into the companies that we invest in. Uh, and so we were thinking about that. We're also seeing that there were several frameworks uh, around ESG that we were beginning to report to, you know, whether it was GRI, the principles for responsible investment and so forth. And so we had this problem of sort of multiple reports. Uh, we had problem that it was, you know, was, was it integrated into the overall organisation's way of working. Uh, and so it's to that point that we came across integrated reporting, which really stitched everything together in our minds. Um, uh, and we began to see that this was, was starting to get some momentum in, in corporate land. Uh, and we wanted to encourage it because we thought it would be terrific that companies that we invest in could be able to articulate uh, their context, that they could explain how they had understood those externalities that could, infect, that could um, impact their profitability over the long term. And we wanted to reward companies that were thinking about long term value creation, not just short termism. But as we know, a lot of the financial services market very much rewards the short term. So when we saw the integrated reporting and the six capitals and the fact that it was more, much more holistic in thinking about value creation uh, and that it was uh, you know, really requiring adopters to articulate who their shareholders are or their stakeholders and how they're creating value and how they're reporting against that, that seemed to us to make a lot of sense. Uh, and so we then uh, thought, well, if we really believe that that's a good model, surely we should do that ourselves. It would make us better advocates. It would also help us understand the implementation of doing something like integrated, uh, you know, thinking and reporting in your own organisation and, um, and be better advocates. So we've been on this journey for six, for six years now and um, uh, we genuinely believe that it's helped us as an organisation in our own strategic planning. Uh, it's helped us understand better how to um, explain our own value creation and measure our own success and be transparent about it. And we also genuinely believe that this is something, a standard that frankly all investors should um, uh, comply with or, or adopt. Uh, that your ability to explain how you are creating value for your constituency is a fundamental obligation as stewards and fiduciaries uh, on behalf of our beneficiaries. So, um, and the final point that I would make is that, um, frankly, as the last uh, few months have, have has transpired, frankly, uh, um, in integrated reporting has even been more valuable for us. Uh, we believe that firms rebuilding from COVID-19 lockdown should give investors a clear report of their strategy, where they're headed, and some of the headwinds that they're facing, and that would help um, the decision making of investors. So if we could move now to the next slide, please. So as we began on this journey around 2014-15, uh, we were seeking to apply the principles, but it was effectively a reporting framework. And I thought I'd show you here the image on the cover of our first integrated report, which when compared to more recent covers, aptly, I think, illustrates our journey. If you, look at the, in the, if you look at the image uh, closely, you can see that the members were photoshopped onto the construction back, uh, background. I think this is a great analogy for the first report. We had, uh, we had to do a lot of retrofitting to fit into the IR framework. Uh, and as I said before, we applied many reporting frameworks at this point, but not in an integrated manner. So to achieve a whole of organisation perspective, 
uh, responsibility for the report shifted from the communications department, which was responsible usually for our annual report, to the office of the CEO. Uh, and that was on the basis that integrated reporting, we believe, needs to be led from the top down. One of our first activities uh, was to undertake a deep dive with our board uh, about our value creation model, uh, which was done at our two day, our annual two day board off site. And so the board with the executive explored our capitals and articulated our value creation business model. CBUS has a strong relationship, as I, said, as I said earlier, with our key stakeholders in the industries which our members work, which is building and construction. And so it made sense to us that our first key area of engagement with uh, the integrated reporting principles was with the stakeholder relationships and the materiality principles as key feeders for strategic focus and future orientation. In the second year, we were still moulding the content uh, to fit the framework. And while due uh, to the strength of our relationships, we had good insight of material issues, there was insufficient synthesis and concise articulation of material issues within our strategy. And data capabilities at CBUS were also in their infancy. So we started with materiality, stakeholder relationships, and then strategic focus. If I move on to the next slide, please. So as we started to build further into the 2016, 17, 18 uh, years, our next stage of the journey uh, in the FY18 uh, years, so I started to achieve deeper integration in strategy, business planning, performance monitoring, and reporting. So working towards the principles of reliability and completeness, and getting a little further on, on connectivity. In 2016-17, we took, undertook pre-assurance. We ventured cautiously into assurance and found assurance providers, frankly, similarly tentative about the evolving role. In 17-18, we moved to limited insurance, but only on some key metrics in the report. Now, the IR <coughs> assurance process, which is entirely voluntary in Australia, is critical in ensuring that those relying on the information in the report have confidence in the veracity of the information. In Australia, as, in, as is in the case internationally, the levels of trust in institutions, corporations, politically, internationally, uh, financially, corporate, frankly, is at an all-time low. Trust levels in institutions is at, at an all-time low. And we see the transparency and rigour of the IR framework is a genuine and a real way that can assist in addressing this trust deficit by creating more confidence in the way organisations create value and hold themselves accountable and are transparent about it. So in this period of our report, we also saw the increasing engagement of the board, uh, which improved connection between strategy, our business plan and reporting. Next slide, please. So last year, <coughs> um, uh, we achieved an Australian first in obtaining limited assurance over our whole report rather than just over limited metrics in our 17-18 report. The assurance considered our compliance with the IR principles, for instance, how our processes and frameworks support integrated thinking across the organisation. We undertook training across our whole leadership group and our executive are now viewing long-term value creation through the IR framework and are really experiencing the benefits of understanding the interrelatedness of factors in achieving our strategy. Now collaboration is clearly one of our organisational values and our maturity in developing strategies, structures and processes ensures we are joining all the dots across the organisation in an increasingly complex external environment and our growing sophistication in our own internal operations, which greatly enhances our capacity to generate value for our members and other stakeholders. Um, so uh, using integrated reporting has enabled us to really join the dots across different silos of expertise and responsibility and frankly straighten us up. So over the past years, um, uh, over the past five years, we've almost doubled our uh, funds under management significantly increased our membership and insourced many complex operational functions, including some of our investment strategies, which has seen our staff increase fivefold. The operational aspects of preparing our report have had to evolve and adapt to this shifting environment. 
Um, and we've been successful in aligning our business strategy with our integrated reporting. And that process has strengthened this year. In fact, our strategy team has taken over the responsibility this year of determining our stakeholder materiality. Next slide, please. So we're strong in our belief that the more holistic approach, that the more holistic approach encouraged by integrated reporting will enable, in, will enable us to drive better outcomes from our investments. And I thought it might be useful to talk about the particular benefits of inter integrated reporting for CBUS as an asset owner. As I mentioned previously, CBUS has been undertaking a process of internalising key aspects of our investment program and activity. Our internal capability has enabled us to be more, a more holistic, to take, to take a more holistic um, total portfolio approach and in itself a demonstration of maturity integrated thinking. Another important benefit of the IR approach for long-term asset owners is that we use the consistency and the rigour of integrated reports provided by the companies that we invest in <coughs> to test their long-term strategy and its alignment with our investment objectives. Research tells us that only 20% of the S&P company value can be explained by its physical and financial assets, down from 83% in 1975. So non-financial factors pose a significant risk for the value of a company and indeed most of our invest investments. So to give you an example of how this all comes together, our global quality team, which takes up, which takes long-term positions in global companies, select and monitor companies against criteria which evaluates non-financial risks. <clears throat> The team is greatly aided by the adoption of IR by the companies we invest in or are considering. And this slide sets out what the team wants to see from companies. This internalised strategy has now got, and it's a new one, it's only three years old, has uh, about two and a half billion Australian uh, under funds under management. Uh, and it's significantly performed its benchmark uh, by almost a 10% uh, per annum amount. So for us, Early days, of course, um, but uh, the performance of that team using this criteria has been um, uh, very helpful. Slide seven, please. So if we look at some of the lessons of, um, of our IR journey, uh, you know, we definitely feel that we've benefited by being an early adopter of integrated reporting. It sets, I think it sets us up well for the, the next phase of, um, of our industry and our challenges. And it's made, us more, uh, made, it's made our strategic processes much more effective, improved our already high levels of trust with our members and other key stakeholders. Next slide, please. Other lessons uh, from our journey. Um, I guess one of the things that we would say is that one of the key lessons uh, is how your organisation needs to mature in its adoption of integrated reporting. Uh, your IR report can't be thought of uh, about as a siloed reporting activity, which is often what occurs in, in organisations and certainly was the case for us previously. It's critical that it's owned by the board, that your CEO and your executive leadership and must closely integrate with all the elements of your leadership, strategy, performance evaluation, risk management, financial management, stakeholder relationships um, and uh, uh, risk culture, to name but a few. As I said earlier, CBUS was the first organisation to attain assurance over our entire IR report. And we did this in an effort to gain insight into what we are doing well and where we could, be, where we could better implement the IR framework. And this does require organisational maturity and a more evolved risk culture. We also have to understand how our data and analytical capability affect our capacity to measure value creation over time. And this has been a challenge at CBUS. Internally, we had a lack of clarity about who ultimately owned the source of truth, the performance team or the data people in the strategy team. Our key strategy metrics didn't always line up with the annual report metrics. So significant effort has gone into aligning our strategy metrics with the IR framework. Next slide, please. Further lessons. Oh, um, uh, actually, this is not the right slide, but anyway, that's okay, I'll keep going. Um, so now members expect us to be straightforward and frank, 
but it's culturally challenging to admit to the fund's development opportunities. No one likes to sort of have that term, you know, the areas you can improve or your development opportunities, especially in an increasingly competitive and highly scrutinised market. We've realised that our people aren't comfortable with highlighting the challenges they face. And frankly, I don't think that's uh, unique to us. Frankly, it's easier to talk about what's going well. It's a challenge to shift from a traditional annual reporting framework, which is often about good news stories rather than frank, long-term and transparent disclosure. We've also realised we need a deeper understanding of our stakeholder views. And so over the, par over the past year, CBUS has conducted member and employer research to understand how these important stakeholders view responsible investment and to test communications to illustrate how responsible investment adds value, a key component to our investment value creation story. That research found that members and employers are strongly supportive of responsible investment when it's explained as managing existing and future risks for the fund. This provided deep, deeper insights and will contribute to how we approach our next integrated report. At CBUS, another principle which always challenges us is conciseness. We like to talk, talk about all the things that we're doing for members, but if we include everything, we'd have more than a 100 page report, which we know is frankly far too long. Next slide, please. So, in Australia, the benefits of being a relatively sparsely populated island and a prompt federal response to COVID-19 has meant that we've not had to deal with some of the challenges you have internationally um, or your organisations. Um, but as at uh, June 1, Australia had reported uh, just over 7,000 cases of COVID-19 and 103 de deaths. This is not to say that we haven't had significant challenges, including volatile investment markets and quite significant changes in policy settings for retirement saving funds. As part of its economic response, the government enabled a scheme that allows people to withdraw up to $20,000 from their retirement savings uh, over several months. This has needed a prompt response from CBUS in terms of managing the liquidity impact on our investment portfolios, understanding the financial impacts on the fund due to the loss of members and revenue in FY21, operational impacts of facilitating the huge and unexpected volume of member redemptions, and a concise multi-channel communications exercise to support sound member decision-making. And so far within our fund, 100,000 members have been paid an early release payment, representing over $800 million. Um, uh, but it will have several months of this program to run to finally see what the final numbers are. But we do believe that the capabilities developed as we've matured our application of the IR framework greatly improved our response to this initiative. I particularly like to call out that it was really easy to bring cross-functional teams together to problem solve, to quickly synthesise insights from external stakeholders and understand what was material for members so we could connect the dots to develop a strategic response. And while this is true across the whole organisation, the maturity of our internal investment team and its capacity to respond with agility and a holistic understanding of our whole portfolio has been a great advantage allowing us to not only navigate the challenging financial markets and sudden regulatory changes, but to be in a position to invest counter-cyclically and provide much needed capital for our economy. You can see through these clips, uh, during this challenging time, we've had a very positive and reassuring narrative for our members, which is that CBUS is creating jobs for members while rebuilding the economy. We believe our investments will contribute to the creation of around 100,000 jobs through the recovery process. And the strength of our strategic and operational response has enabled us to articulate the role which CBUS can make to Australia's road to recovery. And if a crisis is the ultimate test of an organisation's strategy, culture and operations, we feel that CBUS has been able to navigate the uncertainty of COVID-19 and, and continue to focus on the long-term value creation for our members without faltering. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps for us uh, over the next uh, few years, we'll include more evidence-based engagement with the capitals, delivering a more concise report and better integration of all of our ESG reporting frameworks. And in summing up, uh, I thought I would leave you with a, a final reflection that at CBUS, 
we have really encouraged ourselves to think about IR reporting as a journey, strengthening our application of our various principles on an iterative basis and being ambitious about what we are yet to achieve in future years. I hope our insights will assist you to be also ambitious about the benefits which IR reporting can deliver to your organisation. And I'd like to reiterate my call earlier that frankly, I think IR has an important role to play in the global economic rebuilding process. It's an invaluable tool for companies in the new investment and in, in the new post COVID-19 environment, and also believe that it should become a standard for the pension industry around the world. Thank you, Jeremy. I'll uh, hand it over to you for Q&A. Thank you, David, for a really uh, insightful um, overview of CBUS's journey uh, to integrated reporting and integrated thinking. Uh, it has stimulated uh, many questions, which is always a good sign. Uh, I'll come to those in a minute. Uh, I will consolidate them where I can. Um, if anybody has questions about the assurance process, um, please raise them now, but I'm going to um, hold those until we've heard from Michael, um, who oversaw the assurance process. Um, so David, just to, um, to, to start off, um, in CBUS's most recent integrated report, you talk about the different uh, elements of value that are input to your business model, member contributions, a diverse workforce, strong external relationships, your systems, processes and technologies, and natural resources. Um, can you give us any insights into how um, that knowledge and awareness uh, of value creation uh, is uh, <coughs> contributing to better decision making um, by CBUS? I think the best one is, is the one I was just sort of highlighting in, in the presentation, which is that um, <clears throat> because we were uh, getting uh, the, because we created this framework internally and this level of understanding, um, it meant that <clears throat> uh, our investment team, uh, who are you know, investment professionals recruited, it's a team we've built to a, over 100 in the last two to three years, sorry, three or four years. Um, they've come from the fund management world um, and so to have them understand who we're serving, what their interests are, um, has meant that when we're doing the problem solving process or looking for a new opportunity, they've, um, they've had a better appreciation, frankly, of the end customer and that the end customer um, uh, uh, or the, the member uh, is looking for the, from the fund, a fund that's going to enable them to retire, in, uh, so to retire with dignity, to have enough income to retire with dignity. Now, you can't retire with dignity if you are not in work. And so having a healthy economy uh, is a really important precondition to us being able to achieve our goals. When we've done the research with our members and we have our own um, uh, property developer, CBUS Property, which has uh, had an outstanding uh, record, members really like the idea that you take their money, you invest some of it back into their industry to create great returns at fund CBUS property has created uh, over 16% per annum over the last um, 13, 14 years, but also creating employment. That research has helped our investment team understand the importance of um, that value proposition. And so in this current environment, when we were having to deal with the liquidity issues of the early release scheme that I talked about, uh, falling investment markets, we also understood the importance of having uh, the capital available to invest into new opportunities uh, for investment performance, but also to actually help generate uh, support within the economy. So I just use that as an example of integrated thinking um, that, uh, that was, had been a very much easier to do as a result of having done all this pre-work. Great, thank you, David. Um, I'm going to turn now to a question from um, Jacques uh, Fugeli. Uh, he says adoption of integrated reporting within organisations largely depends on buy-in from the executive and the board. It does take resources and time to implement integrated reporting. How can one improve the adoption of integrated reporting within organisations? So I completely agree with that. It, does, it is a top-down thing. I mean, I would not pretend that this has come from the membership. <clears throat> uh, and it, it's, it, it's critical that, well, I guess so you have to step back. So each organisation has got to think about its responsibilities. It needs to understand who it's serving um, and in how they're creating value. Um, and value creation should be thought about in the long term. We want to be able to invest in companies that are going to be profitable, not just next year, but in five, 10, 20, 30 years. And so um, 
And as we know, we're living in a really a complex world where there are many externalities that are not properly priced in. Uh, and so good companies have got, or companies that we want to invest in have got strategies where they've thought about that, they can articulate it, uh, and, um, uh, and are able to demonstrate how they, their strategy is going to succeed. So I just think that's, going back to Keith and Bakshir's point uh, early on, I think that's kind of, frankly, that's 101. But that, that's surprisingly not the way, well, I think the investment market has rewarded short-termism, not long-term profitable value creation. So uh, I think it's an educative process. I think it's also a reward mechanism. This is where I think why our advocacy came into place. We can't expect companies to adopt this while we are, if we're part of a system that's rewarding short-termism, let's reward long-term um, long -term planning, long-term thinking. Let's be that patient capital. Uh, and uh, and, I, and we need and I think that uh, the pension world institutional investors are now starting to have this uh, positive influence into the marketplace and I think that will take us to integrated reporting uh, as, a, as a more adopted model in the future. Great thank you David. Uh, I'm going to raise a question now from Connor Kehoe. Um, Connor um, we're very pleased uh, to have announced recently as the new chair uh, of our council um, at the IIRC. Uh, and a partner emeritus um, with McKinsey. Um, Connor says, uh, how much extra time did the board have to devote to their task as a result of integrated reporting? Uh, well, you see, I hope you like this answer, um, but uh, frankly, if it's integrated, it should be part of their program of work. So it shouldn't actually take up more time. It's more the way you structure your, um, uh, you know, the way in which you have uh, strategic discussions at the board. So we always have a two-day off-site. We always have regular board meetings where, report, where we are reporting against our performance. So it's a matter of just then integrating that into, into that program of work. Now, I, I don't want to be cute here. It does take a lot of effort and time within the organisation to do this. You can't just flick the switch and it takes several iterations as we've talked about. We're certainly not there. Uh, we've still got a long way to go, but we're seeing the value. But, you know, all boards have to do strategic planning. All boards have to monitor their performance. All boards have to think about how their narrative. Um, uh, and I think the IR frame it just gives you a really good structure to do that. And frankly, is an efficient way of doing it. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm going to combine um, several questions which have come in on a similar theme. Um, the, the two parts to it. Um, the first is from Julie Cowley, um, who says, do you think the information provided in the reports is constrained to maintain competitive advantage um, and as such uh, give a true reflection of the company uh, a, a, and such a true reflection of the company may not be given? And then I'm going to ask the, the opposite to that as well, which a number of people have raised, which is, um, uh, are integrated reports being used um, to uh, greenwash the business model um, or to portray uh, the company in a better light um, than uh, may be the case uh, if, um, uh, if, if a, a board um, was being, um, to use a, a phrase we have in, in the UK reporting environment, fair, balanced uh, and understandable in its portrayal of the company to its external stakeholders. So I think that's, I really think that's the question. Um, uh, because, and I think this is why uh, I think our integrated reporting is a really, really important framework to use to address the questions of lack of trust in institutions, to address the question of greenwashing, um, uh, because if you, if you adopt it and you follow through, it requires you to, again, first of all, identify who you're serving and what they want from you how you've understood how you're going to create value for them across the six capitals, how you, um, uh, uh, so in creating that value, uh, that value creation, what your plan is, how you are monitoring against your plan, um, and then how you are measuring success against that plan and that you are being transparent. And I think, uh, this is, I think increasingly in a, in, a, in a world where there is greater regulatory scrutiny where there is greater um, scrutiny from the public, 
from the media, expectations are, as Keith said, you've got to do what you say. And you need to have evidence to prove it. So if you said you, if you make claims, you've got to substantiate it. And I think, frankly, where this then takes you is that you've also got to um, have some kind of assurance process that's independent of the organisation that people can then say, yep, I can see that this is not just an internal PR exercise uh, because this is the next flavour of the day. You've got to truly live it, breathe it, um, uh, and hold yourself accountable to it. And if I take that in the Australian context, uh, and I know this is not necessarily going to be applicable, but um, you know, we've got uh, a, a regulatory environment, it's a compulsory saving system, where we are now required to demonstrate to our regulator any decision we make, that, what the member outcome is. We've done the research, we can identify um, how that decision has impacted various demographics within our membership and there's evidence to substantiate it. The second thing that I, and, and, there, and so we have to report against a member outcomes obligation. The second thing that I think, I uh, can't remember what it's called in the UK, but it's come from the UK, it's um, the um, Banking uh, in, uh, uh, Executive Accountability um, structure that's now interested, coming into our sector. So the key executives in the superannuation industry are now going to be held to account um, through the Bear slash FAR regime, which means that um, each year, uh, well, the regulator will be able to come and say, can you demonstrate what your plan is, who's got responsibility for it, and how they've been um, uh, deploying their responsibilities, um, and what the accountability structure is. Again, I just think IR framework, just then, given though that's the emerging trends that we're seeing, that the IR framework really um, uh, helps you as an organisation respond to those changing uh, regulatory and consumer expectations. Great, thank you David. Uh, I'm going to ask two more questions uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, move on to Michael. Uh, the next is from uh, Yasa Kuo, um, who says, how can technology um, and artificial intelligence affect working in integrated reporting? Well, if I understand the question, I actually think um, uh, that, that new technology, artificial intelligence, could help us in terms of the data uh, collection process and the analytical process, which is really, um, you know, which is really difficult. difficult. So um, I, I think that it's got an important role to play. Um, and if we, you know, if we think about artificial intelligence, looking at, um, I, I can imagine an algorithm being developed by some smart people out there that's look, that are looking at corporate reporting, um, that are looking for key aspects that integrated reporting throws up, um, and then looking at their results. I can imagine that there'd be some smart uh, people out there that are developing that, that would, I think, be very useful for investors. Great, thank you. And then, um, uh, uh, final question, it's a combination of two which have come in, which is, um, how have you changed your incentive arrangements for the investment managers to drive application of integrated thinking uh, and creation of longer term value? Um, what advice would you give for other investment organisations? And that's come in from, from Nick Riddle um, to, to you. So we have uh, included in our, um, so we've got a limited variable pay program. It's not I mean, we're, we're, we're still only two or three years into this. It's been one of the, the challenges for us is to develop a variable prey program. Um, and that was particularly so that we could attract the people we wanted in our investment team. Um, you know, we've been very uh, conservative in our approach. So there's, you know, there's an organisational component, a team, a team component and an individual component. Um, and across all three, there are, um, for the investment team, uh, there are... Um, metrics in there around sustainability, around our responsible investment um, program, um, uh, around achieving certain ratings, for example, through our PRI reportage, um, but there are also other metrics in there that have been included. So our investment team are assessed in part on their ability to integrate ESG into their overall investment program, and we've got clear metrics to be able to assess whether that's been successful or not. 
Great. Thank you, David. Um, I think we need to give you a well-deserved uh, rest at this point. Um, so we will come back. There'll be another Q&A session before we wrap up the webinar. Um, thank you to everybody who has sent in questions about assurance. I haven't forgotten them, but I wanted to wait until we've uh, heard from Michael, who will now provide an overview of, of KPMG's assurance. Um, of CBUS integration report. So David, thank you very much. We look forward to welcoming you back at the end uh, for a joint Q&A with, with Michael. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I hand over to, to Michael uh, of KPMG, uh, IRRC board member and Deakin University. I'd like to do three things. Firstly, I'd like to map uh, what David has just spoken about in terms of the CBUS journey with how that has moved into the assurance piece as well. Secondly, I'd like to put that into a little bit of uh, context for the Australian environment and a little bit of, of globally as well. And thirdly, I'd like to draw out some of the very particular uh, issues that uh, are involved with assuring an integrated report. So if we could move to the next slide. Um, broadly, the top half of that slide is what Dave has just taken you through. Uh, the journey since 2014 through 21 and what's happened by way of enhancement in each year. Uh, I'm going to move us to the bottom half of that diagram and that's been KPMG's part of the journey and uh, the gradient bits in the first few years mean that we were not there uh, the whole time. In fact it was a chance meeting between myself and one of the CBUS executives Rod Masson back in 2016 when we jointly presented at an integrated reporting seminar that got us going. Uh, but we've been with CBUS uh, for a number of years prior to delivering the assurance. And when, when you start thinking about uh, the journey towards integrated reporting assurance, uh, it's this uh, assurance readiness period that is a very important consideration. And for the assurance practitioners that are participating, you'd be aware of that. And I can't overemphasize uh, the importance of the readiness assurance, the assurance readiness period, and look at the preconditions for assurance in terms of the relevant auditing and assurance standards that matter. So 2018 was assurance readiness review. 2019 was the first assured integrated report. Uh, and it was limited assurance against the entire integrated reporting framework and uh, across the whole CBUS integrated report. Uh, in 2020, if uh, CBUS wants us to, we'll probably do that again, but it will be also in the context of uh, guidance that is about to be released during the course of this year by the Assur Auditing Assurance Standard Center uh, on extended external reporting assurance, of which one example is integrated reporting. And I draw your attention in particular to example 10 in supplement B to that uh, assurance guidance, uh, which um, is about integrated reporting assurance. And one of my colleagues and I had uh, a fair bit of work, a fair bit to do with that uh, example 10 being included. Uh, it didn't all get included because you can only do so much. And I'll, I'll talk to a couple of things about that in, in due course. And it might give you some food, food for thought uh, when it comes to thinking about submissions for your own organizations on that consultation paper. Uh, in 2021, uh, I haven't had much discussion with David and CBUS about this. Uh, but I think that uh, as we move forward with assurance, it's going to go beyond just assuring the integrated report itself. Uh, there will be opportunities for looking at uh, the processes that go into producing an integrated report and potentially having some level of assurance on those processes, which we believe will be important to investors and in fact, all stakeholders. We could move to the next one. A little bit of context about Australia. And I'll start on the right hand side there. Uh, this comes from a, a survey, a corporate reporting survey that's done by KPMG in, consult in consultation with Deakin University each year about how corporate reporting is going in the top 200 Australian listed companies. And I want to do no more than contrast the 2019 slide, the top uh, uh, diagram, the top one, and the 2018 slide, the bottom one. And what it's really showing is that um, as we move along the years in Australia, we are increasing gradually the momentum for integrated reporting adoption. The headline for 2019 is the first bullet point there. 
we found that 74% of the ASX 200 are adopting at least some of the principles of integrated reporting the 30th of June 19, up on 2000, uh, up on 48% in 2018. That's at least some of the principles. That does not mean claiming full adoption of the integrated reporting journey. But if you'd like to look at that report, and you'll hear, um, you heard David talking through this with a lot of insight. Uh, we interviewed a number of adopting directors and executives about their own integrated reporting journeys, and three key messages just kept coming through. Number one, this is a, about reporting. Uh, this is about business. It's not about reporting. The report's an outcome. Uh, because integrated reporting has improved our business through the integrated thinking piece. And uh, by way of advice to an organization who hadn't started a journey, the advice was just get started. Uh, quick, move to the next one, please. And this is all in the context of what's happening globally. And many of you would have seen the Accountancy Europe paper that deals with the transformation of the corporate, global corporate reporting system uh, and its relevance, convergence and adoption. And this, uh, this diagram uh, within that report is I think gaining some real traction in terms of the way forward for the global corporate reporting system. And, and I'll leave you to read that in your own time. Uh, but the, the report does mention that in terms of the circle in that diagram there, uh, having a conceptual framework for all corporate reporting, uh, where's the IRC? And I think um, a lot of other uh, commentators, stakeholders in the system believe that the integrated reporting framework has, has a real potential to be at least the starting point for that conceptual framework for all corporate reporting. So that's really important in the context for assurance as well, if we can move to the next one. In terms of assurance, and I'll talk to Australia in particular here, uh, we've just had a, a new corporate governance principles and recommendations uh, issued in this year, now effective. And within that, for the first time, is a recommendation 4.3, which for the first time has a level of recommendations under the corporate governance on what's best practice in corporate reporting. And integrated reporting has a very key piece in that, and it comes through this recommendation 4.3. I'll leave that for you to read at your own leisure, uh, but it has an assurance piece to it as well. Uh, it guides Australian listed companies on how to talk about uh, how they're having uh, confidence in the, in the corporate reports that they're issuing, which could include external reporting assurance of the type that CBUS has happened. So through CBUS and the other Australian assurance precedent, CPA Australia, propelled by ASX Corporate Governance Recommendation 4.3, assurance is on the minds of investors and other stakeholders. And that means something to the CEOs and boards in, in which they invest. Uh, so, and this will be reinforced by the guidance from the standard setters will come through in the very near future. So I think we are seeing uh, integrated reporting assurance as becoming a very important part of what will be the audit of the future. But in fact, it's now the audit of today. Uh, have a look at the CBUS assurance conclusion at the top of that slide. If we could move to the next one, please. In terms of Australia and a bit of thinking about global, what is the home of integrated reporting in Australia? And that means uh, assurance as well. Uh, because uh, be helpful, to, in the extended external reporting assurance of which integrated reporting is a part, it needs to be aligned with the corporate reporting system itself. So the natural home for corporate for integrated reporting in Australia is what we call the operating and financial review in directors reports. Uh, it, it is uh, referred to globally as management commentary, the ISB's management commentary practice statement, and terms I've come across in other countries for something equivalent, MDNAs in the USA and Canada, management reports in the EU. Uh, South African integrated reports under King 4, uh, Japanese integrated reports under METI's guidance, uh, Indian integrated reports under the Securities Board's guidance. In Australia, we've seen a number of large listed companies use their operating and financial review as the vehicle for their integrated reporting application. And I've listed, listed a few there, including AGL. Others have done integrated reports as separate annual reviews 
obvious. Uh, and I cited as the example two major banks, ANZ and National Australia Bank. And then there are other organisations that actually prepare separate annual integrated reports. And I would cite as examples Australia Post, Big Super, and Deakin University. And then there are the special categories, the ones that have gone to assured annual integrated reports. CBUS and CPA Australia, two of the four known instances in the world at this stage. So there is a broad umbrella for all this, and that can really set the scene for the assurance piece. If we can move to the next one, please. please. So what, um, what I, we've observed in carrying out these assurance engagements and in thinking through what uh, example 10 in the, uh, the standards board's guidance uh, we should cover, that's that the global corporate reporting system is globalizing and it's converging. Uh, so it's essential that the assurance guidance must be global. Uh, I think that um, uh, some of the key assurance implications come through the distinctive contribution of integrated reporting in its own right, because the distinctive contribution of integrated reporting in the world of corporate reporting system brings its own assurance implications. I cite three, and uh, David has already spoken to this, and the Accountancy pa Europe paper talks to it. That's that the I integrated reporting framework is a conceptual framework that can provide the basis for all corporate reports. Critically, an integrated report is about communicating the business, its strategy, its business model, its governance, its resources and relationships as a context for reporting on its performance and prospects. I tend to talk about that as the, the what, with, how, and the why of the business. What you've got your strategy with your resources and relationships or capitals in integrated reporting terms, your how being your business model and governance, and your why being your competitive edge. Why you're better at using your, your with in your how to achieve your what, your strategy and realize your purpose. The other piece of the distinctive contribution, which is really important to integrated reporting assurance, is that integrated reporting is a multi-capitals approach for all stakeholders. And that needs to be taken into account every time in the assurance piece. Because what that takes you to is a, a, quite a distinction between two of the key assurance techniques, evaluation and measurement, because they are quite different. The integrated report with its business foundation is going to largely be narrative in nature. Yes, including visuals, diagrams, pictures, graphs, and so on, but narrative in, in, about the business. And from an assurance practitioner's perspective, that brings about the need to have evaluation and judgment. Complex issues requiring evaluation and judgment by the assurance practitioner. As distinct from the assurance technique of measurement, which is more suited to the standardized metrics that come through existing reporting standards, be they financial or ESG. The other thing, and David touched on this, is that the integrated reporting framework provides a great basis for strategically determining self-determined metrics, which are not required by reporting standards today. So the, the audit assurance technique there is a combination of judgment as well as measurement. And then we've got the piece of limited versus reasonable assurance. And the four instances of integrated reporting assurance today are all limited in nature. No one has taken the step to reasonable at this stage. So what I'd ask you to reflect on uh, when you're thinking about the assurance piece and considering uh, submissions to the Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, uh, to what extent are these key integrated reporting assurance issues addressed by the guidance? Next one, please. And one of the things that uh, I think that is an issue in the consultation paper, which is very good, by the way, is the balance of examples in the consultation paper. Uh, there are examples in two ways. In the main body of the document, there are short examples, and there, then there are more detailed examples in supplement B. The guidance itself and the short examples are predominantly about metrics in general terms. 13 of the examples or 30%. 26 or 60% of the examples are about met metrics, sustainability and ESG reporting metrics. In the main body of the guidance and the short examples, there isn't much on integrated reporting, including intellectual capital, so important. 
There are no short examples at this stage on evaluation. There are two only on measurement, which is 5%. There are also five examples, five, five short examples, or 8% on public sector performance reporting. In terms of supplement, supplement B, um, sustainability and ESG reporting metrics take up most of the 12 examples, nine in fact, or 75%. Integrated reporting uh, doesn't have any of the examples really covering off on the evaluation piece. It's mainly about the measurement piece. And there is an example on public sector performance reporting. I should have said that the integrated reporting uh, example, there are two. The second one relates to intellectual capital, which is so critical to integrated reporting as well. Next one, please. And so that takes me to an analysis uh, of these key assurance areas. Uh, I think part of the difficulty, and it's the space of time that the board has had to deal with, it's that you can only do so much. So there's a couple of key assumptions that have been made that have led to not so much evaluation on, e e uh, not so much emphasis on evaluation being given. And that's firstly that the preconditions for assurance are assumed to have been met. And I just take you back to what David had to say in my first slide and say, this takes time. It takes time to get to uh, that, that point. And in the example, reasonable assurance has been chosen. Well, there are no reasonable assurance examples in existence today. So in the table, I've looked at the key assurance areas and I've mapped them against the short examples in the main body of the guidance and what, what is covered off in example 10. And you'll see that there is not a lot about the distinctive contribution of integrated reporting and its consequent assurance implications. It's mainly about the standardized metrics, the measurement piece. Uh, next one, please. So I, I would encourage you to think about submissions to the IAASB. Uh, <clears throat> but it, it's not too late to build up an example 10 uh, and the main body of the guidance to address some of these things, which are certainly the ones that I, I we have addressed in carrying out two of these assurance engagements to date. Uh, David himself won't have seen too much of this because it uh, tends to be what assurance practitioners do, but it's inevitable that our clients see some of this as well. I'd encourage you to make some submissions and we're happy to help. Jeremy, I'll stop at that point. Great, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for a very comprehensive overview uh, of KPMG's assurance uh, of CBUS's uh, integrated report. Um, we've had plenty of questions um, relating to the assurance process. So Michael, if I could ask you to keep your video and, and microphone on, um, I'll raise these with you first um, and then I'll move to some of the broader strategic questions uh, before we wrap up. Um, we've had uh, quite a few relating to the scope um, of the audit. Um, Takiyaki, uh, Takiyuki Sumita uh, asked, at what point will assurance uh, move to limited assurance of the whole report, um, such as the process of identifying materiality or, or justification of the substance of the report? I wonder if you might care to comment on uh, the expanded uh, scope. Michael. Uh, both both CBUS and CPR Australia are assurance conclusions on the whole report. The difference between CBUS and CPA Australia is that CBUS is for the whole of the integrated reporting framework. For CPA Australia, one step back from that, just the content elements at this stage. But both limited assurance, i.e., in our opinion, nothing came to our attention to suggest that the description of the strategy, business model, governance, risks, and so on in the integrated report are not in accordance with what's within the organisation. The step to reasonable assurance is quite a significant one to take because it's at that point where I, I believe that assurance practitioners will have to be in the boardroom and be in the C-suite to observe strategy development, governance, happening in practice. Because when you're talking about an assurance report with reasonable assurance, uh, it's, um, it's on effective operation as well as design uh, and more so in terms of sub substantive assurance evidence than inquiry and observation and limited reviews of documentation, which are the characteristics of limited assurance. Great, thank you, Michael. And, and a related question from Estelle, Amart, who asks, um, regarding external assurance, 
Um, are you using your financial auditor? And if yes, is their assurance or the limited also integrated into the overall audit opinion for the whole annual report? So I think this is really about the relationship between the financial auditor and the uh, integrated report assurance provider. I, I think that, um, it, and I'm, uh, it, the assurance provider for the what I call the front end of the annual report, the integrated report, uh, and the back end, the financial report, can be exactly the same. In fact, I think there's a very strong business case for doing it. Both must use international standards. Both are required to develop a strong understanding of the same business. If you ha have separate assurance practitioners at the back end and the front end, um, well, you, you're at least going to be duplicating. I, I believe that there's a strong case for having uh, one assurer for the whole report, but it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, in the case of CBUS, for example, we are not the financial report auditor, uh, but I just think there's a strong case for it. Uh, and I, sh I should have said that um, in terms of leading an assurance, integrated reporting assurance assignment, I, I believe that financial statement audit partners, auditors are ideally placed. This is what they do. They develop understanding of business strategies and business models and governance. It's, it's, it's just the everyday existence for what they do. Now, skill sets from integrated reporting assurance will be broader. So spe specialist subject matter expertise will be, need to be part of the team. Thank you, Michael. And there's a very uh, good example of this um, in the combined audit and assurance of Philips, uh, the Dutch company, where EY are both the financial audit providers um, and the sustainability report assurance providers, and both uh, opinions are expressed in Philips Integrated Report, uh, which I think is one of the, the shining examples from Europe. Um, so related to that, uh, we've had a question which uh, I'm, I'm going to preface it by saying this applies to all uh, audit firms. It's not unique to KPMG. Uh, and the question is, isn't there a conflict of interest if you are assuring an integrated report and being a major sponsor of uh, integrated reporting? And before you answer that, Michael, I'm just going to remind everybody that uh, when the IIRC was set up uh, in 2012, uh, there was equal support from all of the big four. So EY, KPMG, Deloitte and PwC. So KPMG are not alone uh, in their support uh, for integrated reporting. But I know questions of independence are very close to any uh, auditor or assurance provider's heart. So, uh, Michael, what's your response to that? Uh, I can only speak personally. I feel, I feel completely independent when I've been performing these assurance engagements, as I have any financial statement audit engagement over many, many years. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think that uh, it's a really important thing that um, uh, the, the accounting profession and uh, people within it uh, have a, a strong contribution to make uh, to the shape of the corporate reporting system and the assurance system. I think it's, it's really important that the practical, uh, <clears throat> the practical uh, view on these things uh, is um, part, of, part of the uh, equation. And just like I believe, I absolutely believe in uh, the financial reporting system, uh, because I've lived in it for so long, I also believe in integrated reporting as part of it. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, and David, if I could ask you uh, very kindly to switch your um, microphone um, and uh, video back on. Um, we've had a question from, um, from Paul Druckmann. Um, I'm sure Paul needs um, no introductions. He's the former um, CEO uh, of, um, uh, of the IIRC, um, has been a fantastic advocate uh, for, for many, many years um, for integrated reporting um, and integrated thinking. And uh, I think this is a very good question to ask both of you um, from your different um, experiences. But Paul says, I wonder if, if you might be able to comment on uh, the Australian business environment more generally uh, and uh, over the last few years, what's happened with um, CEO uh, adoption uh, and support um, for both integrated reporting and thinking. Um, and his question is, is this really happening uh, in Australia? And I wonder, David, if, if you might kick off and then Michael, it would be great to hear from your, your client experience, what your view is of that as well. I actually think Michael's a better place uh, in truth, but I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, make some uh, introductory comments or just some cursory, just some initial comments. I think um, in the conversations I've had with directors, 
they um, they get the uh, they get the theory and they like the model, but when it's come when it's when it's come to application, there, there is there seems to be some concern about whether this opens up uh, directors to future uh, litigation uh, in terms of the the um, in a continuous disclosure of future reportings, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, um, I mean, it's disappointing that there's, there's, there's some obstacles to more adoption, even, uh, even though uh, when, you, when you sit down and talk to directors and you talk about, well, wouldn't you want to have investors sitting beside you who get your long-term strategy and are going to see you through the cycles because they think you've got a really good plan? Um, uh, we get very strong responses to that, and we we genuinely believe that integrated thinking uh, is a key component of coming up with long term uh, good business um, planning and strategy. So, um, uh, you know, I think there's still a way to go. But Michael, I think you're a better place to to talk to everyone about um, the Australian context. Yeah, as uh, I think um, the way that you've told the story, David, is it. I, I don't believe in um, integrated reporting being a mandatory thing. I, I believe that it has to be that the organisation uh, is ready, has done its work, has worked out the business case for it, and that, that's the right way. Uh, I think we are seeing uh, increasing adoption of integrated reporting principles, some, some adoption, some uh, full adoption of the framework. I think uh, that, that will continue. I think we're seeing uh, you said it yourself, David, uh, increasing invest the demand for this, but uh, along with uh, increasing invest the demand, I'm detecting an increasing invest the demand for assurances on, on that as well. Because I mean, it, <clears throat> this is all about uh, transparency and trust and uh, credibility enhancement mechanisms, there, there are quite a number. And one of them is external assurance. And can I just add a, a, another point, which is that, um, Increasingly, again, when we're talking to um, investors, um, companies, there is growing, growing frustration about the number of uh, different reporting uh, you know, obligations or, or expectations um, that are emerging across the landscape. Uh, and I think integrated reporting is an opportunity to create a framework in which you can identify what is relevant for your organisation and report it within that framework. So I just think um, uh, as we kind of get into SASB, TS, TSFD, GRI, other sorts of sustainability reporting that's often, um, you know, they're, they're doing slightly different things and all have an important role to play. Uh, companies are looking for uh, some, uh, a common framework in which they can all, they can pull that all together. And I think integrated reporting is the perfect platform to do that. And I think that will accelerate the adoption process, if I'm right. Thank you both. Um, a, a question, um, David, uh, from, from Senem Ozana uh, in Turkey. Um, could you please talk about the comparative long-term returns um, of your funds um, versus the sector, um, which can be um, accounted for by the success of integrated reporting? Uh, I mean, look, I think, um, in terms of the attribution, what I can say is this. Um, so that's a very, comp I mean, that's a very um, uh, complex thing to do, and it's as we, we're still evolving. Um, and whether you can attribute to our integrated reporting, integrated thinking, what I can say is this: um, our fund is a, a top quartile performer, uh, and has been in all all the time frames that our fund has been in existence. Um, uh, and uh, that has that top top quartile performance has come as a result of the way we think about investment strategy and meeting the needs of our members. Um, and it's come about also because we believe we've taken a more holistic view about risk and we've identified, we've, we've been better in our decision making uh, about identifying risk because we've taken a more holistic perspective. We've integrated um, uh, ESG uh, into uh, our overall processes, uh, and so I guess if you know, um, do you attribute that to IR? 
uh, or do you attribute that to the, the way in which the funds understood its obligations and how it therefore deploys its investment strategy? Um, you know, I think they're, they're, they're blended together. So, you know, I find that answer, that question difficult to answer. That's the best I can do. Thank you, David. Uh, that was a, 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 a very, a very a strong attempt to answer a very difficult question. Um, there, there is a very interesting piece of research that was done. It was a combined study by universities of Stanford, um, Pretoria and Auckland, um, which looked at um, financial returns relating primarily to the, the, the cost of capital uh, to companies vis-a-vis um, -vis the quality of their integration reports. Uh, and that seems to suggest that there are direct financial benefits to companies that produce really high quality um, interest reports. So uh, I um, uh, suggest that anybody who really likes to follow up with this might like to start with that study because it's one of the most comprehensive um, and robust studies that, that we're aware of. Um, but thank you, David. Um, I think just um, uh, one or two final questions and then I'll wrap up. Um, uh, we have a question from uh, Helena Sochholm. Uh, he says, is CBUS using the Global Reporting Initiative standards, the GRI standards? Yes. So we, we've been doing that uh, before we adopted uh, IR. We continue to do that. And uh, um, that's an important part of our um, sustainability reportage. Um, um, so the answer to that is yes. Great. Um, thank you. And uh, we can send the reference to, to the study that I talked about when we send out uh, a link to, uh, uh, to the recording. Uh, of this. Uh, and then I think just uh, a, a final uh, question. Uh, I'm going to read it because uh, it's just come in. So I'm going to read it uh, straight off the uh, 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 of the, the monitor. As a, as a member of society, but neither an investor nor a customer of CBUS. Um, so uh, what metrics does the IR report use to let me know how CBUS performs relative to social capital uh, and natural capital? So I think David, see this as a uh, a, a non-investing stakeholder, how would they find out information about your, your performance around social and natural capital? Uh, so on social capital, for example, I mean, the, the narrative I gave around uh, employment generation through the way we invest back into the real economy uh, is disclosed through the report. Um, and on natural capital, uh, you know, there's some extensive reportage there around the way in which the fund uh, is um, addressing climate change, um, again, specifically through our uh, property developer, CBUS Property. Um, we, uh, we benchmark ourselves uh, through the GRES survey, um, which is uh, looking at sustainability in the um, in commercial property uh, and, you know, can pleasingly report that our, that, that, that our property developer is, I think, number two in the world. Uh, when it comes to energy efficiency, it's uh, green credentials around um, uh, the buildings that we build and, uh, and we manage. Uh, so that's just a couple of examples uh, of the way in which we've reported in the annual report, in the, in the integrated report around uh, uh, natural capital. There's other examples though, would encourage people to go and have a read of it. Great, well, thank you uh, both very much. Um, we'll we'll uh, move on and I'll wrap up. Um, but Michael uh, and David, thank you um, both for um, uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, overviews of, of um, CBUS's uh, integrated reporting, integrated thinking journey and uh, KPMG's um, assurance uh, and how both of these have developed uh, over, uh, over a number of years. It's been fantastic uh, to hear um, your story. Um, it's been great to hear an example um, from outside Europe. Um, and uh, I think we can all see how much Australia, or CBUS in particular, and KPMG in Australia are, are leading the way here. Um, there have been uh, many people have written in the chat function to, to say well done and thank you uh, to, uh, to both of you. So I'm just passing on those thanks uh, on their behalf. And of course, thank you to, in absentia, to Keith uh, for providing uh, his um, very um, uh, helpful uh, introduction um, at the beginning um, to CBUS. So we just uh, move on um, one slide. Uh, I will talk to it even if it's not there. Um, so um, uh, we have um, our uh, global conference, uh, which will take place on the 30th of November and the 1st of December uh, in Frankfurt uh, in Germany. Uh, we're running it as a hybrid conference. Uh, it will be 
Uh, we hope face to face, uh, assuming that uh, business travel uh, is permitted uh, within and, and to Germany. Um, if it's not, we will stream it live. Um, for those who would like to attend but can't join in person or, or don't feel comfortable with traveling, uh, then uh, it will also be available online. Um, it is a, a fantastic event. Uh, we've got a, an amazing lineup of speakers. Uh, we know that David is very much hoping uh, to be able to come and speak in person uh, at the conference. Um, so we, we hope to, to meet him in person uh, and welcome him uh, with open arms uh, um, on the 30th of November. Uh, it's an opportunity to gain insights into the uh, 2020 um, International Integration Reporting Framework revision, a process which I'm sure many of you will be aware uh, is, uh, is, is underway at present. Uh, it's an opportunity to engage uh, in person and online um, with a peer group um, and explore how others are measuring and communicating sustainable value, uh, to understand integrated thinking and how this enables business model resilience and adaptability during times of crisis, which of course has been extremely pertinent for every organization in the world uh, over the last few months. Um, here are the details uh, for, for how to find out about the conference and we would be very pleased uh, to welcome uh, all of you um, to the conference. Uh, and um, uh, if anybody would like to find out more about the IIRC's um, business network, uh, then uh, please uh, go to our website uh, or follow the, the link that will be in the, the, the slides when we send through a recording uh, of the slides. Um, so um, thank you again, um, David, Michael uh, and Keith. Um, thank you to Katrina and Zara who've been working behind the scenes uh, to uh, keep this running very smoothly uh, in the background. Uh, and thank you to uh, everybody who's dialed in. Uh, it's been a fantastic webinar and we look forward to hearing from you again. Many thanks. <laughs>